It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 167, Resurrection Power. So Elijah dies of an illness, and according to Josephus, the nation celebrated him upon his death and the great wonders he performed. And with the favorable king in power, he probably welcomed him and really respected him. And upon his death, he made Elisha's death more like a state funeral. Further, can you imagine at this funeral of sorts and the current king of Israel, Jehoash, who resided over it, all the time during the proceedings, he was probably still pondering that moment with the king and the arrow word he was given. Well, Elisha was given a proper burial and placed in a rich man's tomb. Sound familiar? And then something remarkable happens. We don't know the time frame exactly. We do know that through forensic science that a body decomposes to a skeleton in 50 to 60 years. So it could just be immediate, a few years, or if we take it literal that, uh, that this occurs when someone touches his bones, it could be 50 or 60 years from now. All right, so getting that out of the way, we're not 100% sure in our timeline for this account, though in the biblical account, it's immediately after It doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect chronologically. Um, So let's just throw that out. We don't know exactly the time frame, but this is what happens next according to the biblical account. 2 Kings 13.20 Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones... The man came to life and stood up on his feet. All right, because Israel was just starting to solidify its borders again. There was many issues of defense, and one of these left the border with Moab relatively undefended. This allowed raiders to come in and steal and loot the countryside, a very dangerous place, the countryside in Israel at this time. Well, there was a group of people conducting a funeral of sorts as well, and out of nowhere, these Moabite raiders show up. The people scattered and found the nearest tomb, which was Elisha's tomb, and they threw in the dead body of the man being buried. The result was the shock of shocks. The dead man came to life when it touched the body or bones of Elisha. When the dead body touched his bone or his body, depending on how you read it, he came to life. Imagine the shock on the burial party. They must have been floored. Who cares about the crazy Moabite raiders? The guy just came to life. Reminds me of Matthew 27 when Jesus died. Matthew 27, 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Almost a like situation when you compare the scenes. There is so much to discuss here and why it's in the Bible, and namely it's resurrection power. Some Christian preachers state that without the resurrection of Jesus— Really, the gospel doesn't have the power, or the gospel is void in its entirety without the resurrection. Jesus said to show he had power over sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was this power over death which showed he was fully God as well. Victory over sin revealed the Lamb who took away our sin and showed us sons and daughters living on the earth. 
This victory over death showed he was fully God and the lion who would come and judge the world. This is why resurrection is so important. Jesus was fully man and fully God. Further, to list the greatest of miracles, salvation is at the top, followed by resurrections and astounding miracles. Now, we can't proceed here without just confirming the type and shadow of what's going on here. Elisha has always been a picture of Jesus to us. And we get a final glimpse with this resurrection scene. The power of God working through the Son of God. Once Jehu was anointed king, his representation changed to the slain and resurrected Christ. Once the season shifted, when Elisha was walking to Damascus, it was like Elisha came to his representative end. He suffered in great prayer and intercession. He went from representing Jesus, the great miracle worker of three years, to dying in great intercession, headed up to Damascus. In death, he did no earthly miracles after this journey to Damascus. But remotely, with prayer and petitions, here is the final wonderful comparison to Jesus. This scene. Elisha didn't come to life when the, the dead man touched him, but the dead man did. When a dead person's body touched his bones, there was still enough life in them to resurrect another person. There was power in him, even in death. Death, where is your sting? Where was your power? Elisha had even the power of God within him, even after he died. The power of God was still present, even in his death. In his bones, it was residual in his physical bones that had enough power in it to raise someone from the dead. His strength was still available in death. God's power was still available even then. Death, where was your sting? Talk about power. Jesus, who died for our sins and suffered on the cross for our transgressions, died and rose again on the third day, raised to life out of his tomb. Elisha, who died and needed to remain dead, for this was only allotted to Enoch and Elisha and Jesus, yet here he is in his tomb. He remains. And when another body was placed in the tomb, there was enough resurrection power in him. A resurrection from a tomb, just like Jesus. How powerful are these types and shadows? There is something that fascinates me when you study end times and try to figure it all out. We can't forget, God gives the symbols and definitions to his metaphors in the Bible, but also the types and shadows of those who are compared to others before. The Greek interpretation of prophecy is prediction and fulfillment. The Hebrew interpretation is, is types and patterns, confirmations through events and revelations of like events that already happened in the past. Combine the two and we have a more biblical outlook on the things to come. There's an amazingness to the Bible to have prophecies and types and shadows, symbolic numbers and parallel stories within these stories. It's just amazing. And when you're studying a character like Jesus, find the like event in the Old Testament, and you just might find deeper truth. That only confirms more of what you already know about Jesus. David is such a wonderful example since he wrote the emotional Psalms to go with his seasons of struggle and triumph, which fill in those emotional details or the cries and prayers of the heart. Elisha dies buried in a rich man's tomb, carrying resurrection life in him, so much power that when a dead man is laid next to him, he is raised from the dead. It's the Christian walk. It's salvation. It's regeneration. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, let's discuss resurrection power some more. What is resurrection? But the bringing back the life of someone or something. Here's the official definition of the word death. The end of the life of a thing or an object. Death represents the end of the matter. The end of an era or a person's life. In the physical, it's the end of the matter. Ben Franklin had a sense of humor. He said there was two certainties in life, death and taxes. 
According to historian David Barton, the power to tax is the power to destroy. But this is a completely different topic. Okay, back to resurrection power. I'm so surprised there was no third day reference in this scene. But it would have been too obvious, I guess. Resurrection is the reversal of the effects of death, but also the regeneration of a person. Take the resurrection of Lazarus. He was four days in the tomb. He stunk, though he was covered in aloes and chemicals. His body was degenerating. If we're made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body, the spirit and soul had left his body. The body remained, but without life whatsoever. The resurrection of Lazarus had to have involved many actual miracles. His soul and spirit had to be laced back in his body. This is his decaying body, four days dead, had to be placed, the spirit and soul had to be placed back into its his pre-sick state before he was sick and then died. There must have been a whole set of miracles. There's the miracle of the placing back of the spirit. God gives life by breathing of his spirit into man like he did Adam. There must have been direct involvement from the Father in heaven for soul and spirit to return. And a supernatural time reversal of his body or just a recreation of dead cells and body parts. I mean, it's absolutely astounding. When you, and you, if you were to list out every single thing that had to happen for a resurrection to occur to a pre sick state, way more than a miracle. It's such a marvelous picture of the regeneration of a soul. God takes a dead and horrible, defiled soul by sin and does a complete reversal of the effects of sin and death and shame, bringing life to the most horrible of situations. Complete redemption, complete restoration. Take the man at the gatherings. He was possessed and with thousands of demons, and Jesus delivered him. He turned into an evangelist overnight. The God who is capable of resurrection of dead bodies and mighty miracles, the God who is above time and space, the God who is all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful, is capable of all things, and no one is beyond saving, redemption, and his resurrection power. If a dead man's bones, who carried the power of God, still carry enough of his power to raise someone from the dead, even the faintest traces of heaven are enough to redeem any man who calls upon his name. No one, I mean no one, is beyond the rush and touch of God. I can't help but end this podcast with two of the most powerful scriptures in the entire Bible. Romans 8.31 What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Song of Solomon 8, 6 Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord.
Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. So here's a programming note. Next weekend, we'll not be having an episode, uh, but we'll be back the following weekend. And in the meantime, feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com. Share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.